Good morning, Bitcoin. My name is Thomas Hunt, and this is Proof of Work. Proof of Work is a show about the people behind Bitcoin and how they got here. Today, we're joined by Robert from Bitcoin and Friends. How's it going, Robert? Really good, Thomas. Good to be here. Are you enjoying the cruise so far? Yes. I really think that being on a boat has added in an element of like we're kind of stuck together yeah, we are <laughs> but it's a good thing you know because sometimes we our, our personalities can collide here and there and and that's okay and that's part of being human um but but being forced to to be with people and work through issues and talk through issues and not be able to you know walk off and you know go to bed mm -hmm. um basically they didn't they didn't let us sleep for the <laughs> no they 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 scheduled us uh, we have a very full schedule at this conference uh, and we spent a lot of time together the, the the group the family it's a very tight knit group now that was a long way to to say that i'm i'm tired yeah, no yeah. no but i i'm i'm honestly elated i had an amazing time met um just pretty much everyone here that i talked with was amazing um intelligent articulate uh, passionate about Bitcoin and understanding what the vision is and what the common goal is. And um, when you see that unity and you see the people that are coming around, it just, it, it makes me feel like we really are going to do this, which has been a bit of a question. You know, when I got in in 2014 ish, um, it was looking a little rough there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> it was a rough time, I remember, and, and always uh, everyone has such great confidence when it's up and such great fear when it's down. Yes, 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 yes. Um, but I do think that, you know, this last crash, at least for me, and maybe it's because I was in earlier, so it doesn't hurt as much. So that is a caveat, everyone watching. But being able to have some perspective on the market to see the cycles um, play out and kind of live through a bit of almost two now getting into the second one here with the, the uptrend um it has been amazing to see the growth in terms of what i think really is and i honestly think thomas you you led this the the, the marketing arm of bitcoin um I, I feel like you really brought a show that was original um engaging and intelligent and with good guests and and, and good content um you know i was watching your show when i was in my apartment in new york putting together these GPU rigs and yeah, I, had, yeah. I had one ASIC and you know, I didn't make really make any money doing it. Sure, I was sure. kind of late to the game a bit, um, yeah, yeah. but it was a good experience. It got me into Bitcoin learning mm -hmm. more and digging kind of into the more of the technical side a little bit there, right from the beginning. It pushed me a lot. I, I didn't have an engineering background. I was really interested in computers growing up and have used computers a lot. I did some sound engineering work, but I had never uh, done much with programming. And mm -hmm. so, uh, Bitcoin really inspired me to to learn, and I've been learning command line and some programming languages, and you know I have a lot of room to grow, but it's been tremendous to be challenged and inspired to to move in that direction. And so I think you know regardless of what your background is, even if you think you're not good with math or numbers or whatever, you still should should look into programming. I think uh, a lot of people can do it. Languages like Python are very accessible, human readable. Uh, we just need engineers and we need people, um, of course, to do other things, too. And that's what this conference, I think, is more about, which is great, um, which is we need to be on point with a message that is actually going to resonate with people. Um, and I think we're getting closer to that. And again, I just I want to thank you. And I feel like you were kind of a standard bearer from the beginning and ugly, uh, you know, did an amazing thing putting this together. Um, and I see him really as a father figure in a lot of ways to to what's happening um, in, in what I really do believe is the beginning of a resurgence in Bitcoin marketing mm -hmm. and understanding how to go out there and bring an audience. And I, in the tech, you know, the, the tech side, the engineering side um, is, is getting closer too, which is exciting. So I feel like we're, you know, with Lightning, we, need, we, we still need to do some work, quite frankly. The user interface is, is our, still rough and we have to deal with the channel capacity issue. We can't have that if we're going to have mainstream. They, people can't be looking to try to figure out, oh, well, I don't want to have inbound capacity. Why well, don't I have outbound? Like that has, sure. to, that has to go away completely um, or we'll, not, we'll never get there. But I think we can get there. I've heard of uh, an alpha development. I think it's called Loop. Mm -hmm. 
So let's hope that that's not vaporware and that it's actually something, right? But yeah, as far yeah. as I understand, they're good engineers and I haven't looked at the code. So again, this is not like me trying to shit on them. I just don't know. Sure. Right. Um, well, I, I agree with you on programming. It's it's changed a lot since they, they taught it to me when I was a kid. And it was more like they were trying to chase you out of programming. And then the only programming there was was like C++ and assembly. And assembly is very challenging. I've... I do pretty well in school. Uh, the main class that I failed was assembly. Mm. I dropped. Mm. Uh, and computer science was very challenging and threatening at that time. Mm. And uh, since then, there's been all these developments like uh, web page programming and database programming and these specialized areas where uh, you don't have to be a hardcore assembly head. You don't have to be a C++ guy. Um, when I came back to it later on, um, a friend of mine showed me how to use PHP MySQL a little bit. And pretty soon I was building my own blog and I built my own movie database and I had all this kind of like fun programming which I never had that in school I, yep. I never knew what we were doing with the arrays and why we were taking things in and out of them and what we were doing and it, it just it seemed like we were manipulating numbers for no reason and now it's much yep. more yep. understandable what and, you're doing and I think that I would say it sounds like your experience is a lot of what's wrong with education which is especially for men I feel like the way men the way I learn and when I talk to men they tell me the way they learn is by doing and so to learn programming, you actually have to program things. You can't just learn about the theory of programming. Mm, yeah. Um, and so I guess in some ways, maybe I was lucky that I wasn't a computer science major. I was an English major. And so I was, a, you know, coming into it um, without having to go through those traditional channels and maybe get burned by some of that stuff. And, and again, you know, like there's lower level and higher level mm -hmm. languages. Yep. Um, and we need technicians who understand the lower level, but we also need people who can write functional, interesting software on the higher level languages like Python sure. and JavaScript. So that's where I focused. I think it was, you know, the right place to expand my mind and grow and learn. And, um, and, uh, yeah, so. Well, anyway. now, now we're going to go back and we're going to start with everyone's most favorite and familiar question. What was your first computer? Okay. So this is, this is kind of complicated because my dad um, apparently worked for IBM for not even like, I think a year. So he was a math major from Ohio State and he had super high, like always A's, very, very good in math his whole life. Um, he was hired by IBM, moved to California, started working for them and he just didn't take, basically it was like they hire and teach you how to program and they pay you. Yeah. This, you know, this is back when they had main, I think mainframes is sure. uh, what they were working on, right? Uh -huh. So anyway, you know, he's got these big punch card things that he had to program and he didn't take to it, bottom line, you know, sure. for whatever reason, it just didn't work for him. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, so anyway, but he had IBM computers, like basically from the time I was, the time I can remember, he yeah. had like really old IBMs with the big floppy disks. Sure. And he would, he had video games that he brought home. So my dad, I guess, was a nerd. Is really what this comes down to. Love you, Dad. Oh, <laughs> that's well. That's one of the best parts about asking this question and doing this series is that it's usually a family member that brings the computer in. It's usually a, right. a trip to the computer store or a parent who has yeah. an interest in science or computer science. Yeah. Yeah. And and I like I like exposing that because I really think that people do rely on their family and that their family, when someone brings technology to you, or if you have a cousin or something, you can give them a computer or give them a cool book or something to read. Uh, that helps a lot of people more than, more than people think. Yeah. Yeah. We need someone to lead our journey and not to try to go it alone, I guess is what I'm saying. But so, so what would you say was your actual first computer? So, yeah. So I have some memories of those early IBMs and some really weird, like stick figure games. And I don't know the names of them. They maybe didn't even have names because they were probably just like, some guy in his garage made this game, put it sure. on a disc, and they would kind of spread these games. It was almost like a virus, like in a good way. Yeah. But yeah. it's like, you know, you'd get a game and you'd give it to your buddy and he'd give it to his buddy. Sure. So a lot of these games, you didn't know where they came from, right? So I, I don't know. I wish I could get into a time capsule or, or you know, grow, in, what am I trying to say? Yeah, Go yeah. back in time, mm -hmm. crawl into a, a time machine. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Go back in time and look at what these games were. And, sure. Um, so they're gone. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so the first computer that was really kind of mine was a Tandy 1000 mm -hmm. that we bought from Radio Shack. And it wasn't just mine. I mean, it was a family computer, right? Yeah, so let me be yeah. clear. But um, we weren't that rich. But <laughs> yeah, I know. You have your own computer? What? <laughs> well, that's crazy. Yeah. All you kids need to appreciate what yeah. you have. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm kidding. But um, if, you, if your brother was on the computer or your dad was on the computer, you couldn't use it. Yeah. There was one computer in the house right. most of the time. You know? Exactly. Like, yep. Yep. Yeah. So, but anyway, it was a Tandy 1000. Um, we had, uh, I think, w- was it Wheel of Fortune nice. and Jeopardy? Nice. Jeopardy yeah. It was Classics. like a classic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, those are both really good. Oh, I don't know. There were a lot of other games. There was one where we flew around. It was like a ship that turned into a little guy that would walk. Again, I don't know the names. It's yeah. been so long, and I didn't play them that much, but uh, played them enough to, to get, like, the, there's images that are burned into my brain. <laughs> uh, the classics. <laughs> the games. classics. Yeah. I often think when I look at, like, my old Nintendo cartridge or my old Zelda, I think that... Um, my adventures are inside there yeah. that I, I adventured yeah. in Zelda and that this little cartridge plastic thing is where I adventured. And it's an amazing, strange thing yeah. to think that yeah. I was in a chip for a while. Right. You know? Right. And I think a really good thing actually, as much as there was some fear from my mom and family members when, you know, the idea was you could like burn your brain out yeah, you're going to yeah, hurt yourself yeah. if you do too much gaming. And there may be some truth, right? There's a balance in life. You need to balance sure. things. You know, if you find yourself doing, you know, all night benders playing some video game and you miss your job the next day. Yeah. Maybe dial it back. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. That's a good sign. Dial it back. But anyway, my point is, uh, I think, you know, those early games for me were, were all about learning self-sufficiency and the idea that, you know what, I'm going to go in and I'm going to keep looking, I'm going to keep trying, even though it might take a while. Cause a lot of these, these earlier games were really hard compared sure, to the stuff sure. that you have out nowadays where it's like, you know, all these things light up and tell you what to do. Mm-hmm. It's basically just like paint by numbers or something. It's just very and tutorials simple. and walkthroughs. And yeah. then uh, we had, they have a word now they've developed for it. They call it Nintendo hard. <laughs> they just say that because the right. games of that era, and in, if you want to go really hard, it right. goes to some Atari games. Right. I mean, you want to yeah. talk about like, yeah. just there's no yeah. way to win. <laughs> and yeah. Missile Command never ends. There's no one that wins. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone loses. Like, And maybe there's a message in there, right? I think there was. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I can see how it would be frustrating if you took a modern gamer and put him down on Missile Command and they're like, there is no way to win. <laughs> what <laughs> am only, I doing here? Like they say in war games, the only way to win is not to play the game. <laughs> Yes, exactly, exactly. So you had the Tandy and you were playing games. Uh, what else did you do with the computer? What else did I do with the computer? Well, I definitely did get into using the command line a little bit. Mm-hmm. It was a DOS computer, so I did fudge around with DOS. Copy files, delete Copy, file. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, basic stuff. But I, I could get around. And mo- again, most of the motivation was games. It was yeah. like, how do I get this game turned on? <laughs> it's so funny because everyone was, and my parents are the same probably as yours. They were like, you're wasting your time on all these games. And then me, you, Gabriel, everyone I've been talking to, they're like, we had this drive to get more games. And like, we learned computers to get more games. Like, and that this <laughs> is, this was a motivator that yeah. people didn't recognize at the time. They were like, that's not right. And, but it drove us to so much. Like we yes. learned so much on yep. this quest for more games. Yeah, and, and I have to say, I'm at least grateful that my parents let me use a computer to let me play games. Yeah. There are families that have been like, no, you know, if you grow oh, yeah. up Amish, you're not using computers. Sure, <laughs> That's just how sure. It is. it's a huge set, a little setback. <laughs> right, yeah. so um, so thanks. You don't, you don't see many Amish programmers or Amish Bitcoiners. No, I haven't run into one yet, but I'll keep no, my eye out. No, and I have to say, the Amish are peaceful, lovely oh, people. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you're watching and you're Amish, <laughs> <laughs> you're breaking the rules or you're on Rumspringa. Yeah, but, but either way, you're welcome to come join us. Uh, yeah, you know, the there's Bitcoin, love here yeah, for you. So come join Bitcoin. So that's pretty awesome. So you had the early computer. Now, uh, how did you go from having the early computer and playing games to getting into Bitcoin? All right, that's a long journey, but I'll try to make it succinct. Yeah. So the big points would be got into computers, as I said, with the Tandy. Did you stick with them in college? Like more and more. Yeah, I played games. Game? All So I played a lot of games from yeah uh, elementary through early college, I guess, maybe. And I've still played a little bit. It's trickled off a lot. I yeah, just don't have yeah. time. Sure. And honestly, I, I think a lot of the games that I found really um, compelling when I was younger are not that interesting me, to me anymore. Mm. Um, yeah, and I don't know if that's just because I know that I need to be focused on other things, and so I'm telling myself that, yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> or if it's actually true. But I know yeah. I, I hit a wall where it felt like every third-person shooter was just learning a new weapons tree, learning a new series of maps, playing the same game, even um, uh, other, like a real-time strategy, like Command and Conquer yeah. or Warcraft, I was just, I'm just learning the new unit tree. Right. And I'm just learning the new, and it, it yeah, wasn't it's recycled. Yeah, and then yeah. sometimes you'll have a game like maybe Katamari Damacy 
or something where they roll the ball to pick up all the things. I didn't it's play just that so one. creative and new okay. that I'd want to play it or, or the new Grand Theft Auto. I mean, I played the old ones too, but um, the, the PlayStation 2 one, like something like that will break through and I'll be like, that's a game I have to play. That's a reason to buy the new system and yes. actually play because it it's yes. so different enough, right? Yep. And I think that's exactly and that's what, what I'm, I'm looking yeah. for is that different game. Yep. Because I, I play the the standards, you know? right? Right, sure. Yeah, I did. I played a lot of real time strategy games. That was one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there was something about the economics of it that really was like compelling to my brain, um, because you really could learn how to win statistically, like you know, and you could sure. have advantages. It and, was about how how your right. build order was, right. how much right. money you had coming in, and if you could make more tanks. Yes, and I, yes I could yes. always make more yep. tanks right. and then send right. them in. Yeah, right, right, right. So in some ways, it's interesting to think that that game might have taught more about economics than people <laughs> learn funny. in school. It's so funny. Yeah. Um, because it's just, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a, a war game and it's yeah. violent right. and it's going to ruin right. your children. But right. as it turns out, taught us about economics, taught us about choices and trade-offs. And um, certainly if you, if you Zerg rush and you're sending everything in and it fails, you're going to lose. Right. <laughs> you know, or if you build walls and stay home, and your opponent is better than you or faster or more maneuverable or something, you're going to lose there too. So there's a lot of ways to lose in those games. Yeah. And I think for me, you know, bombing city after city to smithereens yeah. just taught me that it's not really necessary to live that way. So yeah. I, I think ironically, it might actually push people away from, away from violence, violence and away from statism, yeah. Yeah, which is interesting. Not expected, I guess. <laughs> so you're sticking with the games. You're sticking with computers. Right, right. Uh, and you're on your way to Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. What, what happened okay, that led so, you to Bitcoin? Okay, so I guess let's just move to the present. Well, I will say one last sort of sure. list, little detail. So I was, uh, I did take some programming courses in middle school. Nice. My mom took me to, I have to give her credit. I was homeschooled until uh, high school, um, which I think was very beneficial to my development. Mm -hmm. Um so thank you, mom, wherever you are, if you're oh. watching. <laughs> um, no, uh, but yeah. So I think it's it was beneficial to be homeschooled. Bottom line, good okay. good thing homeschool your kids. Um, but anyway, so we went to Barnes and Noble, you know, frequently, maybe once a month, and we would peruse. And I was it was so into gaming that I wanted to program games. So that's really nice. what was the impetus to care. So it all comes back to gaming. How yeah. do your kids play games? Yeah. You know? So anyway, I wanted to program games and, and I'd, I'd done a little bit of modding, like, I guess you could say that with like uh, civilization two, I think. Sure. So you could like, you could design your own GIF, you know, dot GIF files nice, and, nice. and create different rules and stuff. So you could modify the game. Um, so that really, yeah, that was fun. I played around with that. Then I thought it would be fun to make games. So anyway, long story short, we go to Barnes and Noble. Uh, got a few programming books, right? Nice, nice. Like programming this for dummies or uh, yeah, stuff yeah, like that. Which, sure. Yeah. So anyway, you gotta start somewhere. Gotta and start I somewhere. actually, those dummy books are really well organized and really easy to read. Yeah. If you want to learn yeah. something, they're not for dummies. They're really good books. Right. Yeah. So I think. I think stupid, the, stupid title. Right. I agree. Uh, I think the name is unfortunate, but I do think they were they were pretty well done. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I went through lessons with those books. I was able to complete the lessons, and you know, I learned some, but. It wasn't, it didn't, it didn't stick, you know, yeah, bottom line. I think yeah. I might've been a little too young, a little, I just, for whatever reason, it didn't stick. Um, I think, uh, you know, and also today, yeah, I mean, we live in a time where if you want to learn to program, it's easier than ever. Um, sure. Uh, tutorials, yeah. options, help, chat rooms. Yeah. Um, the One of the great memories I have from, because I used to break my computer all the time. I would, I would break DOS, I'd break Windows, I'd break the hardware. And uh, when you broke your computer back in those days, you didn't just pull out your phone and read about how you broke your computer. Uh, you were offline. <laughs> Nothing <Right>. worked. <laughs> if you couldn't get the computer back together, get back on the BBSs, you weren't going to get any information about what you had just done to your computer. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was very different than now where it's like, oh, I, I need some help. And you just pull up your yeah. second screen or you go right. to the chat rooms or there's just so right. many more options now. So Yeah. So having, having a mentor at that point would have been really helpful. And I never found that person. And mm -hmm. I think that is part of it. So... If you can mentor, you should do it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, that was then, uh, then, then let's see. So you, did, you didn't go into computer science. Well, I tried to actually. Yeah, so this, stuck is, with it, this huh? is the uh, other uh, fun part of the journey. So I started freshman year as a math major. Mm -hmm. Sorry, computer science major, but I needed to take, you know, higher math classes. Sure. And I think I was in some, some calculus, I forget. So freshman year of college, I have a like a 7 a.m. math class and I just could not stay awake. I literally, I would go to class 
and I would have my notepad out and I'd be taking notes and I would just you know, <laughs> yeah, eventually yeah, nod off. Yeah. And it wasn't, you know, and I was just like a straight A student in high sure. school and always tried and always applied myself. So I think bottom line, it was just a really unfortunate, like, you know, early, early bird thing where I was a night owl and I just yeah. could not hack it. So that, and then of course I needed that credit to continue on and blah, blah, mm. blah. So then I changed majors. I went to Nashville, did music for a year, which is total. Were weird. you an English major or a music major? I was a music major for oh, a year. Then I came okay. back. Yeah. That's so a okay. long story. We don't have to go into that. So I like, I, I like music. Yeah. I did the same thing when I, when I bounced out of computer science, I went to history okay, and right. I was just great at history. Yeah. And I, I, then I studied English for a while and I was great at English. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, it was hard for me to think about going back to computer science where I was not great at it. Right, right, right. And uh, sure. that was a big lesson for sure. me to learn how to be good at things that I'm not great at. Yeah. And uh, that took a long time to learn. Sure. Yeah. I think for me, I actually was not, um, English was not my favorite subject growing up. And so I, I kind of pushed myself. I thought, well, if I'm not going to do computer science, let me tackle something else that I would like to be better and like to improve my ability in, mm -hmm. um, and also explore. And, and I, I think, you know, my dad is, a was a salesman. He was a precious, or sorry. He was a, my God, I'm a little, a little tired. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was a financial planner. So mm -hmm. he did like, you know, he had a series six, he would sell mutual funds and new, sure, sure. that sort of thing. Right. So, um, so that was my dad and long story short, Let's just fast forward a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that was, you know, that was college English, blah, blah, blah. Then I uh, moved to New York, was a teacher for three years mm -hmm. in the inner city because I was like sort of a bleeding heart liberal at that point. I thought I, I could change the world. Dangerous minds. Yeah, 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 <laughs> totally. I bought into a lot of that shit. I think I had a couple of movies like that. And, yeah. Uh, Hollywood, you know. It's, like, it's also my brain, but there is, there's so many, there's much more differences between people than we think there are and socioeconomic differences and cultural differences. And there's, it's much more difficult, I think, to reach people uh, than it might seem than, in, than in, in the Hollywood way. version. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And well, and the lesson that I learned more than anything is that you can have a good heart and go into a broken system. And if it's, if you're just a little teeny cog in a really gross machine, mm. it's not going to change. You're not going to do anything. You're just going to get ground up in the machine. Mm. So, you know, if you work a soulless job, I would recommend finding a way to move out of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even if it means taking a salary cut. Um, I think in the end, you're going to benefit from following your, your heart and not, following money all the time and you right? have to work on an escape plan a strategy build it slowly yes for um, sure but don't, get out of there don't yeah. be rash no. but 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 get out you know? it's good to have a job i always tell people with a bitcoin i'm like don't quit your jobs keep your, keep your damn jobs <laughs> this thing goes up and down <laughs> yeah for sure don't don't think you're going to get rich quickly in bitcoin it takes a lot of patience years of waiting for most yeah, people yeah. um but anyway so that was let's see i taught for three years yep uh, i read this book called dumbing us down by john taylor gatto and after i finished that book i was done teaching i thought <laughs> this is just insane i'm wasting my my time yeah he was like a 40-year new york city public school teacher and sure. he just totally destroys the whole thing and explains that, that why even... it doesn't work it's a prussian model that was used to basically create factory workers yep, yep, um, yep. who could do, you know, very minimum tasks and, you know, just kind of function enough to get by. Well, and that was probably even before the, the no child left behind and the, um, all these yeah. Um, yeah. tests that oh, focus right, on right. teaching to the test because I mean I haven't been yeah. in, in elementary school in a long time and they tell me that it's very different than it used to be we had yeah. PE and music right. uh, we had uh, you know options and the, they didn't have to teach us to this test and now it's very test focused for sure and that's so. another big reason why I moved on because mm -hmm. that was disgusting and my third year I was using a program called the Spalding Method for teaching phonics half of the kids I work with were completely illiterate they could read maybe kindergarten first grade mm. Um, which if you don't have uh, language skills, you can't acquire all the other knowledge. It's no, the no, foundation it's of it block, all. Absolutely. So it's disgusting that it was allowed to be like that. And uh, anyway, the, the, the Spalding method works really well. I had kids go like four or five grade levels in a year wow, wow. using, and I was testing them. Now, again, this is assuming these tests are accurate and whatever, you know, sure. caveat emptor, but yeah. I was very impressed with it. And the principals were not interested because they had to teach the test and da, da, da. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that was, then I moved on to working for Peter Schiff for about four years as a precious metals broker. Wow. And this is before Bitcoin, at least I, before I knew Fam about it. Famous uh, Bitcoin hater, Peter Schiff, right? Uh, not a fan. Yeah. <laughs> Peter is, uh, well, I think Peter's ideas are good in a lot of ways. I mm -hmm. just think he's missing, uh, he doesn't understand how Bitcoin works. I don't think, um, 
he may be too old, quite frankly, to ever learn how it works. Now, I'm not saying that he couldn't if he really applied himself, but he just seems to have kind of made up his mind about a lot of things. And as people age, sometimes they, they get... Uh, so their, their, their opinions become ossified. Sure. And then that's just it. And part um, of that is the success of knowledge and all this experience. And you just kind of become less flexible than yeah. I think you were originally. Yeah. So. But Peter was great to work for. Um, I, I have nothing, you know, but good things to say about him as an employer. And yeah, good guy overall, bottom nice. line. He's, I don't think he's an enemy. I just think he's a little... Uh, and, and was Peter yeah. the one who introduced you to Bitcoin? No. Uh, <laughs> we're, no I we're narrowing this down. We're pulling the threads. I may have almost, I don't know if I had introduced him. I think he knew about it before me, but I, I was the employee that pushed to have Peter accept BitPay, oh, uh, Bitcoin using BitPay. The, the big yeah. question thing where it's like, Everyone if he wonders. hates it so much, why does he accept Bitcoin <laughs> for his gold? And you can all thank all me thing. for that Peter's is. hypocrisy it's, shining through. You know? it. We figured it out. <laughs> He's just a capitalist at heart. He just wants to make money. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. I don't know. But, and and yeah. there's a little part of me that just hopes that Peter is just trying to depress the price who can buy more because <laughs> he's already <laughs> in. I mean, although Peter, if you're doing that, that's not cool. You know? yeah, it's not going to work long term. And it's Watch definitely not going to work yeah. long term. Yeah, it turns um, bad. But yeah. but uh, but yeah. So that was Peter. Then uh, Bitcoin. I, I first heard about it in 2011 at Porcupine Freedom Festival. Great event. <laughs> Met a lot of good people. Um, yeah, good time overall. But um, you know, I saw people using this silly electronic money that could never work because money. Because I mean, my my thinking, like a lot of people, was. Uh, you know, for something to have value, it has to be scarce. All digital files and everything that we know of that's digital is, is you know, infinitely copyable. Yep. I thought They're, I would copy it right away. I right. was like, I'm going to make two of these. I'm going to make so much money. This can be awesome. Right. Exa <laughs> exactly. So I, I just, uh, that, that was my initial thought. And sadly, that kept me from looking into it until 2013 when I saw it in the news again. Yep. Then I thought, why is this like, you know, scam thing still around? <laughs> How is it possible? Mm-hmm. And so I read the white paper and I fell into the rabbit hole like everyone for like weeks of my life. I was just obsessing and, you know, reading everything I could find, watching your videos, I think, or I think it was that or that early. If yeah. I remember right, you were, you were doing videos. Yeah, around so, 2013, we were going in April of 2013. Yeah, yeah. so that's, so. I started looking that summer and so you were already doing videos, Yeah. Um, learned, learned a lot and got pulled in from that. So mm -hmm. again, you know, thank you. Um, and, uh, I mean, then from there, got into programming more, started a startup mm -hmm. that is, I'm now open sourcing the software called CoinCube. This is my great shame because it was like a crypto thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, uh. My great shame. The altcoiner roots come out. Yes. Well, no, I, I was, I will say this, that I've always been first and foremost a Bitcoiner and I've always held most of my, um, my assets in Bitcoin in terms of my investing. Um, and, and I think quite frankly, that it's inevitable that there will be people that take this code, it's open source, they can copy it and paste it uh, and change like two variables and then, you know, put it out there with a little marketing and, and then dump it on their entire community right at the top. You know? As they can do. <laughs> people could do that. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, I believe in freedom. And so I think the answer is not, of course, to like limit the market or only have one thing, but it's for people to talk about it and for the, the cream to rise to the top as, as you would say, I guess. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so how did you go from knowing about Bitcoin and programming and doing this to starting this cartoon show, Bitcoin and friends? Okay. Good question. So the dot there that connects these things is that, uh, my younger brother was going to do some marketing for CoinCube, my startup with me. And the idea was that we were going to record this sort of like AA meeting where all these big coins it would have been like plushy. It, this still isn't a terrible idea potentially or something, <laughs> yeah, some derivative, yeah, okay. right? Yeah, yeah. But basically all these, you know, actors in these big costumes and they're sitting around and they're talking about their problems and, you know, how things are going for them. And yeah, some, okay, some are okay. doing better than others, yeah. but they're all kind of commiserating, I guess. Yeah. And the idea was to try to just essentially encourage people to get along in a sense and, and to, to try to find ways to communicate, even though they may be coming from different places and have different goals. Like, how can we work together? What are our common goals or common, um, you know, and, and, and to sell the software, which was to, ba to create like a, a portfolio. Like you want to buy a bunch of different assets, you can use the software to automate that and da da da. All right. Portfolio management, basically. Sure. 
So anyway, that didn't happen. Well, we were halfway there. My oldest brother and his children, um, and I paid them, but still bless their hearts. They made these, <laughs> these beautiful foam things <laughs> and, uh, you know, and put the cloth and they're, they're very nice. And then, uh, I didn't, we just didn't do it. Mm. <laughs> the idea fell apart. We just didn't execute on it. And so, um, but that was the germ of Bitcoin and friends because it was the idea that we could take the, the you know, these networks that are obviously the coins, the, mas- the coins became mascots. They became yeah. characters. Yes. And yeah. And from there, maybe they developed personalities right, like right, Bitcoin speaks right. a certain way or right. Litecoin speaks a certain yes, way. These yeah, kind of things. Yeah. yeah. So, so give them a personality um, and then tell the story of Bitcoin um, from the beginning. So we start with the first episode with Satoshi, who we don't ever show. He's just a shadowy figure. But Satoshi is is creating Bitcoin, bringing him to life. And then as soon as Bitcoin wakes up in this sort of like an operating table, Frankenstein sort of thing, <laughs> when Bitcoin wakes up, Satoshi says, you know, for your own safety, I have to leave you. And I love you. And then he leaves. And so Bitcoin is in this new world and he's totally confused and doesn't know what's going on. And he gets up off the table and he vomits out his every 10 minute block reward. So I, lo- this, I love this part. It's this, my favorite part. This is sort of like the Sisyphus part of the story. So it's just this rock that he Bitcoin just has to keep rolling up the hill forever. Sure. You know, it's his cross to he's, bear. He's a forever bulimic, right? Yeah. He's always <laughs> going to have this problem. It doesn't matter if he stops eating or counseling <laughs> or anything. Every 10 minutes, this is... Uh, right, yeah. right. It's his... Cr- yeah. Oh, that's true. Slightly better. Yeah. That's a very good point. Thank you. And it is true that, yeah, his, the, the, the redemption of Bitcoin is that as he is adopted, as he grows, his pain is, you know, lessened every four years until there are no more puking uh, opportunities or events. And very small ones. Very, very small ones. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like a burp, maybe. Right. Like yeah. a little burp, yeah. which is not so bad. We that's all burp. Nice. So yeah. that's our hope for Bitcoin yeah. that he makes it all the way to burping um, with much success. And this is going to happen well beyond all of our lifetimes, unless we all get uploaded into a computer or some crazy shit happens. Fingers crossed, holding Fingers out crossed. hopes. Yeah. Somebody, Kurtzweil, get working on Maybe. it. Maybe. Yeah. I'm not the first one trying it, but. <laughs> if they can put Spock's brain in a computer, why not my brain? Yeah, I won't be lining up for that experiment, but if like 50 people do it, and it all it's like 100% success, and they're all like in a computer, and we really can talk to them. You know, and sounds they, pretty sweet, right? Maybe I'd do it. <laughs> hook, hook me up, hook me up. Let's do it. Save your Bitcoin. Yeah, save your Bitcoin. But anyway, um, so you've got some yeah. other characters on the show. Um, interesting, uh, the drive-through guy or the guy with the uh, what are the yeah, other? Yeah, yeah, okay, have? yeah, yeah. Happy to fill in the lineup there. So there's Bitcoin, the you know, and he's a child, right? So he starts out as as you know, less than a year old, and we're kind of into his early years here, of course. Um, And then we have Jones, who is sort of an everyman character. He represents the pain of the economic recession Mm. played out in someone's life. So he loses his job. He loses his home because he was heavily leveraged with too much debt and his home is taken. And then because he lost his job and his home and he was not doing well, his wife and children leave him. (laughs) Yeah, you see the hits just keep on coming, right? (laughs) Yeah, and so this this poor guy is uh, selling ice cream to children and also selling meth and other stuff out of the same truck. (laughs) And you know, he's 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 an entrepreneur. He's an entrepreneur. entrepreneur. And to be completely clear, I think we should legalize all drugs. I think it's a better approach. And then we can figure out ways to help people who need help uh, treat it as a rehabilitation rehabilitation issue, not a criminal issue. Yes. Yes. So, um, so that's our stance on that topic and that's Jones and and he, he brings that into the equation and he also, uh, smokes marijuana a lot, which I think is if you're going to do drugs, that's the best one to do. Children shouldn't do it. Wait till you're at least like 30, you know, but once you're an adult, uh, it's good for your brain. So, um, anyway, helps you relax, helps you relax. It's much, much healthier than alcohol. Uh, I like to, to hit on alcohol a lot. So I'll just do it here. Heroin is a uh, five to one lethal to effective dose. So five times an effective dose will kill you with heroin. Alcohol is 10 to one, which means that alcohol is half as terrible as heroin. And we don't all sit around injecting heroin into our bodies. At least most of us don't. 
Um, so if we not don't on Tuesday, if we don't do that, then I think for everyone's benefit, my advice is just cut back on the alcohol. If you're really addicted, you can still have a little bit, you know, but just cut, cut it down and, and smoke weed. Um, that's, that's the answer. <laughs> All right. So, uh, and, uh, you got some other characters on the show. Do they also so, have a political diatribe? So that's, that's Jones. Yes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's see. Okay. Then we have Harold. He's not so, he's a little political, but Harold, <laughs> Harold is uh, is kind of the the cautionary tale of the story, and so he's the guy who who doesn't buy Bitcoin when he should have. He doesn't believe in it. He doesn't take the time to study, and uh, he's happy to live in his parents' basement. And he works at uh, Best Purchase, and you know he's struggling. And some people are struggling that way, and so we want to give them a voice. So that's Harold, um, and Harold. Let's see. He, what else is going to happen? I'll just give you a few like potential sure, uh, sure. scenarios, well, but coming it, soon. Yeah, yeah. It may be that Harold starts. Um, well, okay. So Harold will possibly invest in a really shitty project <laughs> and then it's going to take off and then he's going to have a ton of money and then he's going to start a YouTube channel <laughs> and then he's going to spout like dispute nonsense and to tell people what to do and tell them how to trade <laughs> and just, you know, be like this guru guy. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, he's, and he'll be so full of confidence from these trades yeah. that he's made for this shit coin. <laughs> right. And like, oh, I was so smart to buy shit coin. And oh, and I bought shit coin. And yeah, yeah I could see that. Yeah. So he'll be that kind of guy. And there'll be other hijinks with him. And But at the end of the day, he's, he's kind of a lovable guy. And he's got little smart Alec quips and stuff. And <laughs> so he'll be fun. And then uh, we have Metallic. How could I forget? Sure. Metallic sure. is classic um, <laughs> computer nerd who's, uh, you know, maybe too smart for his own good or something, um, quite frankly. And it uh, seems that way. Yeah. So very, very smart, um, but also very lovable um, with a good heart, trying to do the right thing. He's in love with Bitcoin from the, the beginning. He's really feeling the, the future of Bitcoin, but he has ideas about adding other and, stuff. And I think you're, you're not just saying like love, but maybe even amorous love. Maybe even amorous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> maybe even that way. And, uh, and so he really loves Bitcoin. Um, but he wants Bitcoin to to kind of adopt to his ideas about how to improve mm. Bitcoin, which are about adding layers and technologies and um, other things. Like, sure. So he's, he basically says, like, you know, Bitcoin, you're your currency, but you could be so much more and you can do all this other stuff. And when Bitcoin re rejects his, you know, advances, he refuses the dark side. Yeah. And then, right. And then Metallic becomes uh, saddened by that and feels let down and like his lover, or, you know, his interest has left him. Dejected. Yeah. Rejected. Dejected. Yeah. Rejected. And so and so he goes and starts this project called Ethereum and um, we introduce this character. And as we get into episode four, uh, I, mean, I can't spoil the scene. It's just too good. Well, it you really just have is. to tune in. You just You're have just to watch, have to see honestly. Four, yeah, but yeah. it basically involves, I'll just give you the hint, which is that at, uh, Metallic is kind of living vicariously through Ethereum to try to get to Bitcoin and yeah, try to... Uh, get so back it's, in there. It's going to be yeah, fun. Yeah, um, sounds good. Sounds yeah, good. And, and so we love we love Metallic. And, um, and then finally, uh, what's the last character here? If, uh, Charlie Lee, a uh, Litecoin character? Oh, yeah. All right. So Char Charlie Lee... Different name for can't sue. Totally different. Charlie Lee. Yeah. 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 Um, Charlie Lee is, uh, so basically this, this story arc is, is we just took the story arc from uh, men in black where the alien comes down. <laughs> We're, it's just an homage to that because it's brilliant. Uh, but basically these aliens send this, this emissary down to take over human body. So if you remember the scene from men in black, you know, sugar water, the alien takes. Sure. The skin yeah. Yeah. Water. Puts on the yeah. skin. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so that's that's Charlie Lee. He's this alien, and his job is to confuse humanity by building this shit coin, and that's what we revealed <laughs> in story, episode. True story. True <laughs> story. Right. Um, called Litecoin, <laughs> and um, and so he creates it. And but the alien, and the alien council is not going to be happy. Like <laughs> it's shitty, but it's not bad enough. It's <laughs> still too good. Yeah, okay. So more shit's going to happen, and he's it's going to be a fun story arc. And I can't give any more away than that, but. Uh, if, uh, you know, on video, I can tell you. But, sure, you know. sure. <laughs> so, so those are the characters on the show, and the show's animated, and it's on YouTube. 
Yes. And um, I don't know, give a shout out to your brother because I know your brother does a lot of work on the show. Yes. Tell us Thank about, you. about yeah. his contributions. Um, so the, the show is created by my younger brother, uh, Chris Allen. And, you know, this would not have happened without him. This is his baby. Um, I really feel like I'm more of like, a, you know, the, the conductor just trying to keep the, the, the boat moving. But yeah, like yeah. all the work is being done um, by a team of brilliant people led by uh, by Chris. Oh, Hal, Hal 50. Yeah, that's a good character, too. He's supposed to be Hal Finney. Um, and Hal, Hal, wherever you are, you rock. Yeah, Thank like you Hal. for all He's your really work. Amazing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we, we try to have a little fun with him in the show. But he, he, you know, he has a speech at the end of episode one where he basically says that uh, once you understand Bitcoin, you realize that it's, you don't need to get rid of your Bitcoin. Like, that's it. You don't have to sell it in the future. Sure. When we get there, you'll just use Bitcoin. Yep. Right. And so that's a brilliant... Um, yeah, that, that's where we're going. It's a brilliant place. Uh, so anyway, but back to, uh, I was talking about something else. We got- I think we're just uh, getting towards the end of the show yeah. and just want to, you know, let people know where they can find oh, Bitcoin and friends and what, yeah. Tell let me, more I'm about sorry. Chris. Let me yeah, say yeah. a little more about Chris. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, where yeah, I was. I got, of, I got sidetracked. Yeah, um, yeah. This is the important part of the show. Like, but yeah, so, uh, so it's been amazing working with my brother. You know, we have a natural connection, obviously being siblings that makes it easier to communicate. And we've been able to hash through the story together a lot. Nice. Um, and I've been able to, you know, I've been uh, happy to help him write some too. So I, you know, I'm getting, as this thing grows, I feel like I'm going to be more and more involved, which is exciting. Um, but, but Chris, you know, does the voice of Bitcoin, which is brilliant. He does quite a few other voices in the show. Um, also jumper Jake, um, who does the voice of metallic, and uh, a few other characters. And we've got uh, P.D. Pablo, uh, very talented, famous rapper who's doing the show. Like, it's, it's really, honestly, it's kind of a dream come true. Like, the lineup we're getting. And, and now I come to this event and, you know, networking with people such as yourself, Thomas, and, and Ugly and others. And so we're going to make this show big. It's going to be it's going to be huge. And we're going to, and the reason we're doing this, I guess this is the main thing I should end with Sure, is we're doing this because we want Bitcoin to succeed. And we know that it won't, um, if we don't make it so that people can understand it. And it's not easy to understand right now for people who are not technical. And we have to, we have to recognize that if we want mass adoption, we have to, uh, to take it to people in a way that they can digest it and use it. And so that's what we hope to help, uh, you know, accomplish. I think that's a great goal, and it's definitely, like you were saying earlier, something that I started with Mad Bitcoins, trying to make it fun and understandable. And certainly when I saw the cartoon, I was, I was really excited because it reminded me of South Park. I watched very early South Park, and I was I was like, this is you know what we need to take it forward. And it's, it's very irreverent, and you know maybe it's not for some people and it's sure. for others, but it has its own voice, and it's clearly, it's technically accurate. The things about Bitcoin, the things about Litecoin, these little, you know, the Ethereum features, these kind of things it's yep. it's giving people some knowledge with the jokes with the the cartoon which people love cartoons and the humor yep. and everything yep. so yep. i think it's, it's really good work and shout out to chris as well yep. uh, he needs to come on the cruise he needs yep. to come out here uh, we'd have him here as well uh, in the future yeah we'll have him in my great, place next so. time that'd be nice i'll take a break i've done a lot there of interviews although this has been one of my favorites really um it, it, it's been tremendous to get to sit down with you i feel really honored well thanks so much i really enjoyed learning about your first computer thanks, thanks thomas yeah